many clients, when they first hear that we can cure their anxiety, they express skepticism, and with good reason. Currently, the mental health industry is not making known that it's possible to simply cure your anxiety, especially with the results we've had, for instance, to be able to cure it within 15 minutes. The reason why probably is because showing people that they can cure their anxiety quickly is just not profitable for anyone. The mental health industry currently pushes drugs and uh, talk therapy, which could involve you talking to a psychotherapist or a psychologist uh, endlessly for sessions in a row after session for hours uh, without giving you the actual tools you need to solve your anxiety completely and obliterate it from controlling your life. This is a serious problem. There are 40 million people in the United States that are suffering from anxiety right now. That's 20% of the U.S. population. So I ask you, please, I'm giving you this information for free. Take it, use it, and if you find it helpful, share it with someone else who may also benefit from having their anxiety solved. So how can you solve your anxiety? Well, in order to be able to cure anxiety, you must first understand where your anxiety is actually coming from. We feel it in the body. We feel the anxiety perhaps in our chest or in our stomach. The sensations that we're getting, although they feel physical, they don't actually start in the body. It's not a primarily physical issue. The anxiety that we're experiencing comes from the source of the pain, which is our mind. Many people say, well, my anxiety actually is hereditary because my parents had anxiety or I've had anxiety my whole life. They feel like anxiety can't be solved because their anxiety uh, has gone on for so long or their family members had it. Uh, but the reality is your anxiety is not a result of something chemically imbalanced in your body. Your anxiety is not a result of a gene uh, that has been passed down from your parents. Uh, your anxiety is a result of something that's happening in your mind. But you have to understand what's actually going on in your mind in order to be able to address it. You see, you probably have spent your entire life neglecting your mind and your mental health. Many of us put lots of emphasis on the physical health. In fact, we learn about physical health in society. We know that we need to have good diet and good exercise in order to have physical health. But what do you need in order to care for your mind health or your mental health? If you're drawing a blank, don't feel bad. It's generally not taught to us what we need to do in order to care for our mental health. But it's oh so important because your mind is the most valuable thing you possess. So who are you? Not what are you, but who are you? You are not just your physical body. Now for us as humans, we recognize we are higher than the animals and what makes us higher than the animals among other things is our superior sense of self, our consciousness. We have just a sense of our existence in which we can exert our free will and make choices and decisions on following our dreams, what we will do, what we will build, how we will do it, to be able to create art that's pleasing to ourselves and others and, and design things and to better ourselves and to improve. We have a consciousness that is superior. Your consciousness exists within your mind, which is seated in the brain. The consciousness is referred to as by psychologists as your ego or it's your self. 
the ego is the self. So when you say me, you're not really just referring to your physical body, are you? When you say me, you're referring to yourself. That self is what we're going to focus on. Because all of us are more than just our physical body, we also have a separate part of ourself, which is the person we are on the inside. It's the metaphysical self. It's beyond the physical body, but it works in harmony with the physical body. Our physical body is also a big part of ourself because without the physical body, we would not be alive. When I refer to the metaphysical self, the person you are inside, I'm not referring to some immortal spirit part of yourself. I'm referring to something that is very much mortal. Your ego, the metaphysical self, is in fact fragile, vulnerable, and mortal, just like your physical body. It can die. But you need to care for its health. So inside of your mind, you have different parts that are working together. To make things simple, we'll refer to the two main parts, your subconscious and your conscious mind. Your conscious mind is the seat of the self, your personal identity. Your mind puts together concepts, ideas, beliefs, and values to form what you know as yourself, what you hold to be who you actually are and what you actually are beyond just the body, but working synergistically with the body. Your subconscious mind runs automated systems holding not only the beliefs and the ideas of who you are, but keeps certain things in your body running subconsciously, such as your blinking function or your breathing function. But you will notice that you have control over your blinking and control over your breathing largely. But when you don't think about it, it runs automatically. That's the difference between your conscious and your subconscious mind. You should lead your life with your conscious mind. That's the autonomous part of yourself that can decide, I'm going to keep my eyes closed, or I'm going to keep my eyes open, or I'm not going to breathe right now. I'm going to hold my breath, or I'm going to continue to breathe. I'm going to take deep breaths. Your consciousness has the ability to override some of your subconscious automatic functions. This is important to understand because when we think about our emotions and our anxiety, a lot of times we have the mistaken viewpoint that we cannot control our anxiety or we cannot control our emotions. That's just simply not totally true. It is true that our emotions run on an automated system, like our blinking and like our breathing. But you have the ability to override your automated systems like blinking, like breathing. You can also override the automated system that's controlling your emotions. And it's all stored, yes, in your mind. Your subconscious runs the automated systems that feed you your emotions. But what really is anxiety? To understand it, you can look at your nervous system in the physical body. Your physical body has nerve cells throughout the entire body so that if ever there's anything poking it, pricking it, cutting it, or burning it, your body will send you an instantaneous sensation to your mind to cause you to pull away from whatever it is that could be possibly harming your body. So the pain sensation that you're getting is actually helpful. It's a good thing because it's there to protect you, to warn you that something could be damaging your body. Your emotional system is like the nervous system, where the nervous system works with the five senses so that you can interact with the outside world with the physical body, even giving it its warnings and its signals, your emotional system works with the metaphysical self to give it warnings and signals and allow you to interact with the outside world. So your emotional system processes deeper concepts such as friendship, 
uh, loyalty, honesty, trust, uh, your values, your beliefs. So it's able to give you signals such as joy or happiness. It gives you signals that make you feel anger and sadness. Your emotional system is what allows you to see a cute puppy and say, aww. Your emotional system is what allows you to see injustice and become indignant and upset. Your emotional system is how you interact with the outside world on the deeper self, the metaphysical self, just like your nervous system and your senses allow you to interact with the outside world for your physical self. So when you feel anxiety, you are feeling pain. When you feel depression, you are feeling pain. But that pain, like your physical pain, is actually a good thing because it's there to protect you. It is your your emotional system signaling that there's something that needs to be worked out. There's something that's that's troubling you inside your subconscious mind. Likely, it's a memory of something in the past, some past trauma, or it could be something that is hypothetical for the future that you're concerned about. But when it's disordered, it's not actually something about the the current present state that you're in, is it? When you have disordered anxiety, you're feeling anxious about something that's not even happening right now. So to understand how to solve this disordered anxiety, Let us take a look at how anxiety works when it is ordered. When you have orderly anxiety, it's actually a good thing, right? For instance, you sit down to take a look at your bills, and as you open envelopes, you get a a look at one particular envelope, and you know it's for a company that you need to pay. And you get a tinge of anxiety because you forgot to pay it last month. And you know that if you don't pay that bill soon, There's going to be consequences and services are going to get shut off. So your anxiety moves you to quickly open that bill, look at the past due amount, get your debit card out, and pay that bill right away. After you pay the bill, the anxiety is gone. That is ordered anxiety. So anxiety is not always a bad thing. The problem is when we're feeling anxiety like that, but we're just sipping our coffee or doing something simple like laying down on the couch, but we're feeling like we're gonna have a panic attack, we're just walking through a grocery store. So to understand dis- disordered anxiety, what's actually happening is unlike the ordered anxiety, you were able to take care of it, you were able to do something to take away the source of the anxiety, which was your thoughts. Your disordered anxiety is also coming from your thoughts. It's something you've pushed back to your subconscious and you've said, I can't deal with this right now. Something from your past or something in the future, for whatever reason, you haven't dealt with it. In order to solve your anxiety, you have to deal with it. You have to listen to it because it's your subconscious mind letting you know that there's a problem, letting you know that there's something it's trying to protect you from. Your anxiety is an expression of your self, your subconscious self, trying to protect the conscious self. It's a good thing. Don't run from it. If you continue to pacify your anxiety through drugs, alcohol, and distraction, you are more likely to develop disordered anxiety. So how do you solve it? Well, step one, To solve your anxiety, and if you have your pen and paper, there's going to be four steps. Your first step is to acknowledge that anxiety is helpful. You want to acknowledge that anxiety is a gift. Of course, you want to obliterate the disordered anxiety, but take a second to appreciate that the anxiety that you're experiencing is an expression of your own subconscious's desire to protect you. It is a gift. Be grateful that you have anxiety. You don't want to be a person that has zero anxiety because then you would be like a zombie. Because then you would go through life and you would not pay your bills and you would not do things that need to get done. 
and as a result, you would forget to pick up your kids from, from soccer practice and your life will fall apart because anxiety is what keeps us moving and taking care of things, putting out fires, so to speak, in our life. It's healthy to feel a little bit of anxiety. So step one is to thank yourself, to, to really feel gratitude that you have this wonderful gift that, that your subconscious mind is communicating with you. Step two is to identify what is trying to be communicated. To do that, you're going to ask yourself, why am I feeling this pain? Why do I have this anxiety? In order to find the, the anxiety, you, you, you might throw the roadblock and say, well, you know what? It's many things that are causing my anxiety. I can't identify the one cause. But in reality, even if there are many things causing your anxiety, typically you'll find that 20% of the issues are causing 80% of the pain. So identify the source of the stress. What is actually causing the anxiety? To do this, you'll need to, to stop everything, sit down into a quiet place where you're alone. Take a deep breath, close your eyes, and ask yourself, why am I feeling this pain? What is my mind trying to communicate? What am I afraid of? And then you will see the answer start to manifest itself. Let's say the answer is, well, I was thinking about how my kids are getting older and they're going to move away. Okay. Now that you've identified what the thought was that caused the anxiety, and always your anxiety is being caused, triggered, and sustained by thoughts in your mind. Once you identify what the thought was, now you can move on to step three, which is to go deeper into that thought and identify why it's causing you so much fear. Okay, so I've identified that I'm afraid because my children are moving away. But why does that cause me so much fear? Well, because if they move away, I feel like I'm not going to see them again. Let's go deeper. If, I, if, I, if they move away, I just, I feel like I won't know what to do because my whole life revolves around my children. Let's go deeper. My children are my, my happiness. If they move away, it's like I'm losing my happiness. Now we've identified the deeper fears associated with, with why this idea of your children moving away is causing you so much anxiety and it's hitting you at random times. It was pushed into your subconscious because you couldn't deal with it. You couldn't rectify it. So you said, okay, I'm just going to distract myself. And now it's coming back to get you at times when you're just trying to drink your coffee and you keep getting reminded of it. So it causes you anxiety. So now that you've gone deeper and you've realized these things, you want to write down on a piece of paper the thoughts as you've identified them, such as, I feel like I'm never going to see them again, such as, if my kids move away, they're my source of happiness. Now, once we've identified these things, we also will notice uh, an issue about them, and this will help us understand why the anxiety never got worked out. The issue with these thoughts is, they're not very helpful, very kind, or very positive thoughts, are they? I'm never going to see my kids again? Is that even true? It's not actually true. I think we're ready for step four, the final step. Step four is kill the monster. What does that mean? Well, imagine a child is in their bed at nighttime and they're yelling out, I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared. A loving parent will rush into the room. What's wrong, honey? Why are you afraid? And the child says, because there's a monster in my closet. How will a loving parent handle that? Well, perhaps that loving parent might go to the closet, turn on the light, and say, there's no monster here. Come take a look. And by using truth, logic and positivity he'll kill that idea that there's actually a monster in the closet when the lights are off 
showing the kid quite logically and quite scientifically that there is no monster in the closet. Another loving parent might handle it this way. Says to the child, okay, if there's a monster in the closet, I'll go in and kill it. And then that parent goes into the closet, rustles some clothes around and kicks some shoes and makes some noise and grunting sounds. And then they finally come out and say, I did it. I, I killed the monster. You can now rest assured and go to sleep. Now, according to the child, according to the age or whatever, the child will be comforted by the parent taking one of these approaches. You also have to deal with yourself like you are a child. You have to speak to yourself like you would speak to a child because your beliefs in your subconscious were formed when you were a child. Your fears in your subconscious were formed when you were a child. The subconscious self really in many ways is quite childlike and you need to speak to it the way you would speak to a child kindly. Many people talk to themselves harshly at times, right? They'll say, you idiot. But that's not how you want to talk to yourself because if it would be abusive to say that to someone else, then why would you say it to yourself? It's still abusive. You can abuse yourself. And when you do that, it's not healthy. It's not good for your mind health. It's not good for the health of your metaphysical self. It's not good for your mental health. And you speak to yourself harshly. So you must speak to yourself kindly, like you're speaking to a child. And now you need to reason, just like you would with the monster in the closet, you need to kill that monster by using truth, positivity, and replacing that negative, unhelpful belief with a positive, more helpful belief. For instance, we've identified in this example that we're afraid because our children are moving away and the two deeper things are that we think we'll never see them again, or we felt like we are never gonna see them again, and also that our children are a source of happiness. So if they move away, we'll lose our source of happiness. So now to defeat the monster, we have to reason with ourselves. First of all, is it really true that you'll never see them again? Turn on the light of truth. Is it really true that you're never going to see your children again? Well, no, no, that's not true. I said that because I just feel like I'm never going to see them again. But no, it's not true. Let's replace the untrue statement or untrue belief. I'm never going to see my kids again with the actual true belief. So we're going to take this out and we're going to discard it and we're going to hold on to what's true. This process is much like the digestion, digestion in the body when your intestines extract the nutrients and remove the waste. We're going to get rid of the waste. This idea that I'm never going to see my kids again, we let that go. Because I 100% believe that I will see my kids again. Let's talk about that other thought, though, because it's very scary since my children are my source of happiness. As I reason with myself, are my children my only source of happiness? Should they be my only source of happiness? In reality, it's not healthy for my children to be my only source of happiness. That's codependency. So... Even if I did fall into that trap in the past, it would actually be healthy for me to let them go as my primary source of happiness or my only source of happiness. The more healthy thought is my children are a source of joy, but I have many sources of joy. And actually, my children will continue to be a source of joy in my life. Do you believe that? Well, that's 100% true and it's healthy. My children are a source of joy. They will continue to be a source of joy, but I have many sources of joy in my life. So now, since they're moving away, let me start to focus on some of these other potential sources of joy. Let me spend more time thinking about that. Let me magnify this positive, helpful thought, and let me demagnify and minimize this unhelpful idea. Let's discard that. As you do this, you will notice that your anxiety comes down to a nice manageable level. You don't want it to be gone completely. You just want it down to where you're not having that panic attack. This process will cure your anxiety. 
but you may need to repeat it multiple times because you may have multiple beliefs and ideas and scary thoughts that cause you anxiety. So you may need to go through the four steps again. I'll demonstrate one more time. For instance, so let's imagine uh, you're having a cup of coffee or you're in a grocery store and you suddenly get an anxiety attack. And so you have to go through your steps. Your first thing is to thank yourself and to be grateful for this wonderful gift of anxiety because it's communicating something to you. Your second step is to find the source of the pain. Okay. I was feeling anxiety. Why am I feeling this anxiety? Oh, I know. I was thinking about that person I'm dating. And I'm afraid that this person is just too good to be true. I mean, they seem so wonderful. So chances are they're going to hurt me at some point. Okay, let's go deeper into step three. Let's ask ourselves why. Why does thinking about my... Uh, boyfriend or girlfriend make me feel afraid well because I think that they're so good that they're too good to be true so definitely they're gonna hurt me because every person in my life including my parents has ended up really devastating me hurting me letting me down or abusing me at some point so definitely this person has something negative about them too and I need to focus on those negative things and so that I can identify that, that they're not going to be a good person in my life. Okay. So let's go into step four and let's kill this monster. First, we want to identify uh, how we can view things a little bit more positively. For instance, is it true that every person is a bad person and every person is actually going to turn out to be bad and negative and hurt you in the end? Well, not every person is out to hurt you. And it is possible that some people could be good. You'll want to keep some of your anxiety because it'll protect you from the many hurtful people that do exist. But if you're in a relationship and the person seems to be good, maybe a more healthy approach is to give this relationship some time. Take it slowly. Set firm boundaries. And allow yourself to observe over time if this person really is as good as they seem. This way we can avoid self-sabotaging and ending the relationship abruptly, thus causing ourselves more anxiety or just obsessing over this idea and causing ourselves anxiety. So we'll take this old thought of this person must be bad and I have to find the flaw and we'll throw it away and we'll replace it with the new, more healthy idea that we're going to give it time. We're going to keep firm boundaries. We're going to take things slowly. By addressing things this way, replacing those old thoughts, having that new positive thought, the anxiety comes down to a manageable level. You can use these four steps to cure your anxiety. You can use these four steps to help someone in your family or your friends, if they're willing, to have their anxiety cured. Also, if you're a therapist, utilize this with your clients. Teach it to your colleagues. Please share this video, comment below if it's been helpful for you. But if you have trouble getting these methods to work on your own, it's not a problem. You just need someone to help. Reach out to a therapist that's qualified and trained in these four steps. You can utilize the link that I'll leave in the description below in order to reach out to a therapist that can help you. Thank you so much for watching the video.